Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodai, your host for this program. And in this program, I have this weekly uh, privilege to uh, sit with you and hear the stories of men and women who uh, were drawn uh, to have a, a faith in Jesus Christ and in his church. Uh, in fact, I was just recently uh, reading one of the, uh, the, the readings in Mass from the book of Acts about Paul going to uh, Philippi and meeting with this lady, Lydia, who happened to be a believer in God, but she wasn't a Christian yet. But Paul meets with her. She would have been Jewish, and Paul meets with her, or maybe she was a, a pagan believer in God. But it says in Scripture that the Lord opened her heart to receive what Paul had said. And, and in a way, that expresses that the conversions that we hear are both our own response, but there's a work of grace there. And how we respond to that is very important, which is when, when we think about people in our life that we would love to be open to the faith, our job is, is to tell and to love and to pray for, but recognizing that we're hoping that we're planting seeds in the grace that's in someone's heart that may be receptive. So our guest tonight is Marshall Feitlin, a uh, convert from Judaism. And uh, Marsh, it's great to have you on the program. It's great to be here, Marcus. I'm, I'm anxious to hear your story, but also about the, the relationship of your faith to your work as a psychologist. Uh, and you and I talked just briefly that, that good Catholic psychologists are few and far and hard to find. Uh, <laughs> and maybe that's why, as I'm sure we'll hear about, you've got your website, right? That, that's correct. That helps. So, well, let me back out first and, okay. and invite you to tell us your story. Okay. Well, it starts with my grandparents, both sides. Uh, my Jewish grandparents came from Babroysk uh, in Belarus. At the time they came over, it was part of Russia. And uh, they didn't live too far from the scene of Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, uh, oh. And in fact, they came over to this country about the same time the characters in Fiddler on the Roof came over. Oh, fascinating. So yeah. That gives us a visual image exactly <laughs> what they would have gone through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, on my mother's side, uh, her family came from northern Italy, from Asti. Uh, they were called Piumontesi. And uh, Asti is famous for its wine, Asti right. Spumanti. Right. Uh, my uh, Jewish uh, grandparents came over here with their children around 1906, and my mother's people came over around 1909 something like that. Uh, fast forward, my mother grew up in Connecticut, my father grew up in Connecticut, and they met in New Britain, Connecticut, um, a factory town in the middle of the state. And then the big question was, where are we going to get married? Because my mother was Catholic, my father was Jewish, and so there was this conflict. This was back in the early 30s, so that kind of a marriage was absolutely shocking. Yep. and unheard of. And my mother made efforts at getting the marriage in the church, but my, fa my father was quite willing to go through a Catholic ceremony. He wasn't very religious, <laughs> uh, but he didn't want to raise his children Catholic, and so that was the snag. So they went back and forth about this, and finally my mother gave in, and they ran off to um, Atlantic City, New Jersey, and got married by a justice of the peace. <laughs> And uh, they lived there for three months. By then, my mother became pregnant with me. Okay. They came back to Connecticut, and they lived with my father's mother and father, Bubby and Zadie. Mm -hmm. And they put great pressure on my mother to become Jewish. And she was 20 years old, uh, pregnant, and uh, away from her own family, so she agreed. And so she became Jewish. And uh, then she and my father settled down and started to raise me in the Jewish faith. So I was circumcised. I had the pidyon haben when, 40 days after I was born, and uh, went to Hebrew um, Sunday school and so forth. And uh, attended uh, Passover at Bubby and Zadie's house every year. We would go to Passover. And I have to laugh when I see Christians doing Passover services because they're so restrained and dignified. A real Jewish Passover is nothing like that. <laughs> uh, it's chaotic. Uh, children are screaming. Uh, parents are shushing their kids. The women are calling for help in the kitchen. 
and um, Zaidi and the men would be sitting at the op at the far end of the table with the Haggadah, the prayer book. And it's a very long recital of the Exodus, very long. And it was late in the evening. You have to wait until sundown, and this is usually in April, and everybody's hungry. Uh, and, but now, <laughs> Bubby was a stickler for doing things by the book, but Zadie, mm, not so much. And so when Bubby would disappear into the kitchen to get the next dish, Zadie would take the Haggadah and go... <laughs> a few pages to kind of cut it short a little bit. Which is funny to think that we, the Catholic Church, <laughs> continuing that have the huge Easter vigil with all the readings, yeah. you know, we've, we've carried the tradition on. We do. And uh, sometimes uh, in some churches they decide, no, let's don't do that, let's don't do that one. Or, or don't do the short route. <laughs> well, that was the way it went. And then after the whole thing was over and the meal was done, uh, the women went into the kitchen and did the dishes and talked, and the men went into the living room and told jokes in Yiddish. And they would, uh, so the kids would just be sitting there listening to these jokes and not understanding a word, but we would be laughing because the men would be laughing at the jokes, and I would say to my father, what did he say? You know, what's the joke? And my father would say, you can't translate it into English. <laughs> so that was my experience of, of Passover. Um, I did experience anti Christian um, things uh, growing up in my Jewish family. Um, one thing, of course, um, is that it's kind of paradoxical. Uh, uh, the name of Jesus was never pronounced. And the only other name that's never pronounced is the name of God. And so it seems interesting that yeah. the name of Jesus was treated the same way as the name of God. But it was, he was the forbidden fruit. And yeah. Nobody ever said anything bad about him, but he was over there with them, but we don't do that. Um, and there was a certain way of talking about Gentiles uh, that was demeaning. There's a term shiksa, which means a Gentile woman, but it's a um, derisive term. Yeah. And people would use that term in front of me uh, who have a, a, a Gentile mother, uh, not even realizing that um, I was offended by that. Yeah. Yeah. So I this would have been a time when, the, when your Jewish yes. family would have also been persecuted, at least to some extent, in the community. I yes, assume. there was, there was anti-Semitism, too, yeah. Right. And they were, that was going back and forth. And, right. You know, they were responding to that. Yeah. Um, when I was um, about uh, 13 or 12, I was going to Hebrew school and learning Hebrew, and my grandmother, Bubby, approached my mother and said, um, Marshall is becoming a teenager now, and he's going to start dating, and it wouldn't be appropriate him, for him to date Christian girls, so he should only date Jewish girls. And I was, at that time, not particularly interested in Hebrew school, and my mother had had it at that point, and she said, that's it. And so if I had been saying, you know, I don't want to go to Hebrew school anymore. So finally, when after this conversation with Bubby, she said, you don't have to. So I withdrew from Hebrew school, did not get bar mitzvah, and that kind of ended my Jewish experience. Um, I did experience, among my Catholic friends, anti-Semitism. Uh, the term Christ killer, you know, would come up a lot. And, um, yeah. and I thought, uh, you know, how can I be guilty of something that I never did? And, but this was how a lot of people thought. And I did experience that um, very painfully in a, a, um, a camp run by the YMCA. Hmm. Um, in those days, um, they couldn't be too particular about who the counselors were. And um, the kids were really um, kind of shunning me because I was Jewish. Yeah. And I was sitting down dejected one day, and a young man came over. He spoke with a European accent. I didn't know then what it was. I was about 10. And he asked me what was the matter, and I, his name was Kurt. I'll never forget that. And he um, befriended me. And he was probably, I thought he was a grown man. He was probably 18 at the time, and he befriended me, and he told me how wrong it was to, that other people should treat me that way. And uh, when there was a program that was put on, 
for all the campers, he got up and spoke, and he spoke about that. He didn't mention my name, but he spoke about anti-Semitism and how it was wrong. So there was that um, in the Catholic, in my Catholic experience. Now, backing up to get the Catholic thing, <laughs> um, my first contact with the church was at the age of three when I was baptized. <laughs> Uh, my mother... Clandestinely? Yes. My mother <laughs> and my aunt, my mother, dis, my, well, my grandmother, this is now my mother's mother, grandma, she was lamenting to my mother, more or less forcefully, that uh, she was sad that her grandson, this is the only grandson she has that isn't baptized. And apparently she did this repeatedly. And finally my mother said, that's it. And so she got my aunt, her sister, who was a teenager at the time. They put me in a stroller. I was three. They wheeled me down to St. Joseph's Church in South Main Street in New Britain, Connecticut, and uh, had me baptized. And after the ceremony, the priest said to my mother, I probably shouldn't have done this. And then she wheeled me back, and she told my grandmother, and nobody else knew about it, including me. Uh, but I think uh, that's kind of an argument for infant baptism, because I think uh, the Holy Spirit was whispering every now and then to me as I was growing up. Um, for example, when I, the big thing was when I was five, and it was around Christmas time, and all the lights were on in all the homes, and people were singing these beautiful Christmas carols, and I was just entranced by the beauty of it all, the sound and the sights. And I said to my mo mother, and again, I can remember exactly where it was. It was on the corner of Brooklawn Street and Shuttle Meadow Avenue in New Britain, Connecticut. And um, my mother uh, was taking me for a sled ride, and my Jewish aunt was with us with my cousin, and I said to my mother, what is Christmas? And my mother said, Christmas celebrates when God became man. And I thought, that's exactly what I need. Now, looking back at it, I, I wasn't aware of my thinking, but looking back at it, that's what I was thinking, that it was hard to pray to a God that was formless and that was so different from us. And uh, I found that hard to do. And, uh, and I used to think, wouldn't it be nice if God became a man so I could talk to him face to face? And then when my mother said that, I was thinking, that's exactly what I need. And, that's, and he did exactly what I needed. Uh, what condescension? Now, I wouldn't have used those words at the age of five. Yeah. But I had that really uh, intense experience of that. It was uh, an experience of the beauty of it. Hmm. And then I forgot about it afterwards. Then um, we had a babysitter, and every now and then uh, she would sleep over with her younger sister, and she was Catholic, and one Saturday she slept over, and she and her sister got up Sunday morning. It wasn't even light out, uh, and I was about six, maybe. Uh, they got up in, in, to go to Mass. And I just sat there in my bed and watched them getting dressed and going out to Mass. And I thought, wow, this is important. These people really take this seriously. And it really impressed me with the seriousness of it. Then another time, a few years later, another sitter, uh, her name was Aurelia, and she <laughs> was a Lithuanian by descent. And she used to babysit for me. And one time uh, she was over during the day, and my mother served her lunch. And it was on a Friday, and my mother served her a ham sandwich. And Aurelia took the sandwich, and she started eating it. And my mother said, oh, Aurelia, I'm sorry, uh, it's Friday. And Aurelia spat out what she had in her mouth. <laughs> and I thought, boy, these people take this stuff seriously. And I was really impressed by the seriousness that Catholics take their faith. Especially because as a Jewish family, you're having a ham sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or just for those listening on the radio, Marshall uh, Fighton is our, is our guest. And uh, uh, what fascinates me, these little seeds mm. that the Lord is planting in yeah. your heart, as you said, and with hindsight, in response to your baptismal graces. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
So then, uh, during the Second World War, everybody was planting, planting victory gardens. And uh, my friend, his name was George Kuhn, he was, uh, his family had planted one, and I was helping them harvest and eat the tomatoes. And one day he said, well, I'm going to go to confession, and would you accompany me? I said, sure. So I was 10, maybe. So it was the first time I'd ever been, that I remember, I'd ever been in a Catholic church. And I went into the church. It was St. Joseph's Church, the same one that I was baptized in. And I noticed the candles, and they were in these blue cups. And there was something fascinating and beautiful about it. And, um, and then I just sat in the back, just taking that all in and realizing there's something awesome and bigger than me about this place. And I still remember that. So, so that was another uh, experience that I had that kind of, you know, made me think. Had you been as a family attending the, the, the Jewish? No. Uh, although my grandmother and grandfather were strictly Orthodox, uh, most of their children were not. And um, my father told me he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. Uh -huh. So he only observed things for the sake of the family. And so since we lived um, quite a distance from my grandmother, he observed none of that. Okay. So we didn't attend uh, Sabbath services. We didn't observe kosher. I was wondering, in comparison to what you were experiencing there as a young man in the beauty of that sanctuary yeah. with the candles, what you were comparing it to, you really didn't have a, much of an experience. No. Of a, no, I had gone to, to right. uh, synagogue services, but, but uh, not much. Nothing like that. Like, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that was uh, part of my experience of the Catholicism. Then also my grandmother, the, Jew, the uh, uh, Italian grandmother, uh, she lived in the same town we did, and we used to go to her home every Saturday for her spaghetti dinner. And um, <laughs> my mother and I would go, and my aunt, the same aunt that was my sponsor at baptism, who never said a word to me about it afterward. <laughs> um, and I noticed my grandmother had a crucifix on the wall over her bed, and I looked at it, and I wondered, what's he doing up there? Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I didn't make the connection with God Became Man that my mother had told me, but I was just looking at it and just wondering, what is that? And, and it had a certain fascination. And then she had um, a picture of the Pope, and I'm thinking it was St. Pius X, because that would have been the pope that was in was reigning when she was living in Italy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he looked like a kindly man. He was all in white with a white hat on and smiling. And that was on her bureau. And then she had a beautiful crystal rosary in her jewelry box. And I thought, isn't that beautiful? And I admired it just as a piece of jewelry. It was just something beautiful. I knew it was religious in some way. I didn't know quite how. Um, so that was... Um, that was my experience of Catholicism. And then um, my grandmother, my Italian grandmother, died. She passed away. She was very ill with cancer, and she died. And then I went through a crisis of faith, and I thought I couldn't handle that. The only religious instruction my mother had given me basically was that God exists. He wants you to be good. He sees everything you do. And he, and he rewards goodness and punishes evil. And that was basically all I knew. I didn't know anything about heaven or hell. Yeah. And so when my grandmother died, I couldn't fit that into anything larger. And I said to my mother, God isn't nice, to, or God is cruel, I forgot how I worded it, uh, to let grandma die like that. And I lost my faith in God. And so for a while I was kind of a atheist, I guess you could say or at least angry at God. Yeah. And then we come to my friend Barton Whitehouse. <laughs> uh, by now I was 15, 14 or 15, and I was a caddy in the summertime. I would go caddying at the um, golf course, and so did my friend Barton. And he, Barton was a Baptist, and um, he heard me talking with some of the other caddies about something, and I don't know what it was. But he befriended me, and then uh, he didn't live too far from me. And we used to walk home together after school. And uh, one day he said to me, do you believe in Jesus? And I said, well, I'm sort of 
undecided. I said, I'm, I'm on the fence. He said, you've got to be either for him or against him. You can't be on the fence. And this is where I think the baptismal grace came in again. And I thought for a moment and I said, I couldn't bring myself to say I'm against him. So I have to, if I have to choose, then I have to say I'm for him. So that was my <laughs> act of faith <laughs> with absolutely no catechism leading up to it that I'm not going to say no, and if yes is the only option, then I'll say yes. He said, well, then you have to come forward. You have to accept the Lord. You have to join the church. And I said, well, I guess I'll become a Catholic like my mother was. And he said, oh, you don't want to do that. And he told me all these awful things about Catholics, and so I listened. And then I thought, well, maybe I should be a Baptist. Well, then summer came. And I went to work at the tobacco farms. I wasn't caddying anymore. Now I was working at the tobacco farms, picking tobacco. And by the grace of God, there were three or four seminarians who were also picking tobacco. And they got me talking about faith issues. And I said, well, I'm going to become a Baptist. And they said, well, why don't you want to become a Catholic? And so then I told them the things that Barton told me. Oh, they said, that isn't true, or we have an answer for that. And they started to give me their answers. Then I would go back to Barton and say, this is what the seminarians told me. And Barton would say, oh, no, 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 no. And then I was back and forth and back and forth all summer long between Barton and the Baptist, Barton and the seminarians. And then it was in August of that year, uh, we, I was, we were on the tobacco farm. And I said to the seminarians, well, I think I'm pretty made up my mind that I'm going to become a Baptist. And they said, why? And I said, well, the Catholic Church has added so much stuff to the simplicity of the gospel that I don't want all that. I just want the simple gospel. And they said, like what stuff? And I said, well, the Pope. And then they started explaining Matthew 16, 18. And they said, you know, Jesus said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And I said, so? And they said, well, Peter means rock. And at that moment, um, I didn't hear anything or see anything, but it was like a thunderclap. And um, I just became absolutely convinced Peter is the first pope. Pius XII is now the pope then. Um, I have to become a Catholic. <laughs> Boom, that's it. Christ wants me to do this. And it all happened in an instant. And so I said to them, well, then I'll become a Catholic. And they said, what? And because it, this all happened in two seconds. And I said, yes. And I repeated my thinking. If Peter is the first pope, if Christ said that to Peter, essentially he's making him the first pope, then Pius XII is his successor. That makes sense. Therefore, I have to become a Catholic. So they said, well, then you need to see a priest. You need to see a priest and uh, get instructed. I thought, oh, because <laughs> I'd never met a priest in my life, and I was uh, really scared. So they made an appointment for me to see Father Bumbalinski, and I went to the rectory, and I stood there at the door and knocked on it, and I was just shaking. I expected Bella Lugosi in a Roman collar. <laughs> and uh, Father Bumbalinski was wonderful. He opened the door, made me feel right at home, sat me down, and... Um, started catechizing me, and I would go there every week. He gave me uh, The Faith of Millions by Cardinal Gibbons and The Question Box by Father Conroy, and I bought the, the Knox version of the Bible, and I was poring over those books. And um, I knew it was wrong to lie, and I didn't want to tell my folks that I was going to a catechism to become a Catholic. So I said, um, I'm going to, this is, these were in the days when everybody didn't have television. I said, I'm going to the Y to watch television. So then I would take the bus downtown, I would go to the Y, I would watch television for 10 minutes, then I would take the bus over to Father Bumbalinski and I would do my catechism <laughs> class. Um, mental reservation, you know. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so I did that with Father Bombalinski. Then eventually he said, uh, you might want to see your priest closer to where you live. So he switched me over to Father Fenton. Father Fenton did, uh, instructed me on uh, the councils, uh, all the ecumenical councils. We went through the catechism. He took me into the sacristy and showed me all the vestments that the priests use, explained the color system of the liturgy and everything. 
And um, it was then that I got, which was not typical for those days, I got interested in um, following the Mass with a missile, uh, which we think, well, everybody does that now. But in those days, very few people did. Most people would kind of say the rosary during Mass. I was going to say, it, it was Latin. Then. Yeah, it was all Latin. I mean, everything's Latin, and you probably didn't know very much Latin. Not then, then no. <laughs> and so uh, I had my, my missile, and I could follow along. So I started using the missile right from the get-go. And then Father Fenton said, well, you're ready for baptism. So then he switched me over to Father Mullins, who was a, a curate at the very church I'd been baptized at, St. Joseph's. And Father, Father Mullins' task was to get my mother to agree to baptize me. And I was thinking, this is going to be wonderful. All my teenage sins will be washed away silently in baptism. So <laughs> Father Mullins went to see my mother, and he said, you know, Marshall wants to become a Catholic, and uh, would you be uh, willing to uh, agree to have him baptized? So she said, well, actually, he is baptized. And then she told him. So Father Mullins went back to the church, checked the records, and sure enough, you know, I was. So he told me that. And I thought, oh, no, I have to confess all my <laughs> sins to a priest. So, uh, but anyway, we got the permission, and so uh, he said, what, then what the next thing for you to do is go to confession and start receiving communion. So I went, so I told my mother what I was going to do, and I went to confession, and the priest was uh, very, I was scared, again, scared to death, and the pri I said, this is my first confession, and I, he said, wait a minute, you know, and then he wanted to make sure I was prepared for that. And I went to confession, and then he spoke to me, and he told me that you're going to see a lot of Catholics who don't practice their faith and are very half-hearted, and you can't let that scandalize you. He didn't use that word, but that's what he meant. And you have to stay faithful even when you see people around you doing things they shouldn't be doing. And he was very, very kind. And I have to say that my experience of confession uh, ever since has been relief and uh, receiving understanding and compassion. And it's really been a very beautiful thing for me. So that was my first confession. And then I went to communion the next day and started becoming a Catholic. And right after I went to communion the first time, there was a retreat for high school kids. So I went to the retreat with some Catholic friends of mine. And then in class the next day, at public high school, we were chatting about it. And m one of my cousins, Jewish cousins, uh, was in class with us, and she heard that. She said, Marshall, what are you doing going to a Catholic retreat? And I said, well, I've become a Catholic. And so then this started a conflict between me and one cousin and then another cousin. And the uh, second cousin, both girls, they would argue with me about this and how I shouldn't have done this. And one of my cousins said, well, after all, Jesus was a Jew. And I said, I think that's a point for our side. <laughs> and um, so we would argue back and forth like that. And um, it, my grandmother never knew about it. Uh, and uh, then the, the next Passover came along. And the question was, can I go to the Passover? And what should I do there? And so forth. And so I asked a priest. And he said, well, yes, you can go. But you just can't participate in the, the formal prayers, which I didn't do anyway. Uh, so I went. Well, as uh, luck would have it, it was on a Friday. And so I was thinking, how am I going to maneuver this, eating this food without eating any meat? Because they had chicken. Uh, so uh, the first course was kefilte fish, which I really didn't like. Um, and so I just filled up on gefilte fish. <laughs> and then uh, m my aunt was commenting to my mother, look how Marshall loves this gefilte fish. And my mother was saying, yeah, she knew why I was doing it. <laughs> and so that was kind of how I <laughs> got through the Passover. I said I was too, too full for the chicken, and I kind of passed it up. <laughs> well, then I graduated high school, and I decided uh, this was back in the day when you had to go into the service either before or after college. And if you went in before, then you got the GI Bill to pay for your college. So I thought, that makes sense. So I decided to join the Air Force. Well, I told that to Father Mullins, the priest who had arranged for my <laughs> baptism. And he said, you'll lose your faith in three weeks. Don't do it. Well, I didn't listen to him. And, and I joined the Air Force, but I was scared to death I was going to lose my faith. 
So what I did was to go to daily mass and observe who the guys were who went to daily mass and then hang out with them. And so we got a little click going there and we just escaped all the nonsense going on in the barracks and, and so forth. That sounds like a good strategy to pass around to folk, you know, if they come to a new community and they wonder how to find friends, we'll go to daily mass and yeah. get to meet. Well, I'm, I'm gonna pause there, Marsh, because okay. it's a good time for her to take a break and we'll uh, come back and we'll pick up right in your store. You're in the Air Force, right? Okay. okay. Right. See you a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And before we go to Marsh and pick up on his story, I just wanted to remind you of the book, which I had the, the privilege of writing the foreword for. Uh, Brandon McGinley, the editor, took uh, nine of The Journey Home guests whose journeys were from atheism to Catholicism. And he did a wonderful job of editing the stories and put them t t together in this uh, fine collection called From Atheism to Catholicism that's published by EWTN. Uh, and if you were to look at the names of the list, uh, Rhonda Shervin, Joseph Pierce, uh, John Barger, a number of guests that uh, Kevin DeVos that you would recognize from Journey Home episodes. So I encourage you to consider picking up this book. You can get it from the uh, EWTN Religious Catalog. Again, that's From Atheism to Catholicism. All right, Marsh, let me step back away and let okay. you continue in your journey. Okay, well, I, after the military, I uh, just thought that I had a vocation to the priesthood and uh, to the religious life, so I joined a religious order, the Benedictines, and they sent me to study for the priesthood at um, in Ottawa, St. Paul's Seminary in Ottawa. And a year before I would have been ordained a deacon, I decided, no, God is not calling me to this, and I left. <laughs> And um, I went back to St. Paul's as a layman and got a degree in theology, taught theology for a couple of years, mm. got married, and then I decided uh, I can't stay teaching theology because it was drying up. Lay theologians weren't in demand anymore. Mm. And I need to get into another field. And I noticed that when I was teaching, students would come to me and with their problems and want to talk about problems and so forth. And I thought, I, maybe I'm cut out to be a counselor or a psychologist. So I went back to graduate school. And now this was the first time uh, in my life that I had been in a secular um, graduate, graduate program. Mm -hmm. I'd been in secular grade schools and high schools, but from college on, it had always been Catholic. And uh, I didn't realize how different uh, a, a secular environment was. And one example of that, well, a couple of examples. One is I was, uh, to help me through graduate school, because now I was married and I had a daughter, uh, I accepted a job as a head resident of a dorm. And so this was Oxford Hall in the University of Maine at Orono, and I was the head resident there. <laughs> and it was an all-male dorm to start with. And then uh, a year later, it became a co-ed dorm. That was the, the thinking back then. It was good for the couples uh, to mix and so forth. And uh, there were all kinds of debates about parietal hours and all of this. And um, the RAs were given instructions to um, kind of instruct the students about contraception and which ones to pick and so forth. And um, so I w would have meetings with the RAs and I would uh, gently explain to them that there's also a, an option called abstinence and there's a lot going for it. And so I would try to push some more sensible notions with the RAs because they were getting this crazy stuff from the administration. But then in my actual, my graduate program, um, one of the funniest things was a course I was taking on human sexuality. And the professor gave us a book to read, uh, Love's Body by Norman O. Brown. I'll never forget it. <laughs> and uh, Norman O. Brown's theory was that if you thought that 
heterosexual intercourse was better than the alternatives. That was heterosexual tyranny. And what you needed to think instead was what he called polymorphous perverse. In other words, that any, what people think is perverse, any form of sex is equal to any other form of sex. And um, so we, uh, we were supposed to read the book, so I read the book, and then we came to class and he wanted to know what we thought of it. There were maybe like six students in the class. It was more like a seminar. When it came my turn, I said, well, I thought for the first half of the book that he was joking. I thought it was a, a put on. I said, because it's obvious to me that that form of sexual expression that put me in being, I have to consider better than the alternatives. And the whole class got angry. Uh, and the professor got annoyed. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. I, again, I hadn't realized how yeah. different the secular schools were from yeah. what I was used to. And so I said, yes, I, I, I don't think that a, a, these other forms of sexual expression should be considered as equal to normal, to, I didn't use the word normal, but to heterosexual uh, expression, because that's, that's how I came into being. And I have to honor that as part of my self-esteem. We're always talking about self-esteem. Well, there it is. And one of the students, a, a girl, she said to me, well, then, Marshall, if that's your opinion, then, then what about birth control? And I said, well, that's a problem. And, um, and the class went on like that. But that was one of my experiences in graduate wow. school where I realized um, maybe it's uh, I'm talking too much. <laughs> and maybe I need to kind of uh, keep a lower profile because uh, I don't want to get. Um, what time period was that? Uh, 1970s, early 70s. So early 70s, and this publisher in this book, this mm -hmm. author of this book, it's interesting to see where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. That at the time, well, I'm actually a little surprised that your class was so already for it, but it was oh, that yeah. was the 60s, 70s. Yeah. But the general public wasn't there no. yet at all. This is all going on in the universities. Yeah. 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 And and here we are, the result of that. Exactly. Yeah. And it hadn't, it hadn't trickled down. So, um, yeah, th th that was one experience that I had. Then after graduate school, I was applying for jobs, and um, I got into trouble um, uh, three or four times. Um, I, I would apply for the job, Every, the uh, interview would be going very well, and then it was almost like it was scripted because every single one of them did it exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, they would say, Marshall, uh, we serve a very diverse community here. Uh, what if a young woman came to you who was very upset about being pregnant? And so I was playing Thomas More. I was not going to reveal my hand unless I absolutely had to. <laughs> so I said, well, I would be compassionate and I would uh, listen to her uh, story and try to reach a suitable conclusion. And then the next question was, uh, what if she opted to get an abortion? I, and I said, well, then I suppose she would get it. Meaning, I'm not going to throw myself in front of the door and not let her leave until she has the baby. Uh, and then the question came, would you make the referral? In other words, would I do it? And then that's my Thomas More moment. Then I said, no, I would not make the referral. And then it was, thank you very much. We'll get back to you if we're still interested. The, it would come to a close, and that would be it. And that happened to me three or four times. Wow. Oh. Uh, so um, you, uh, so there was a price to pay. I mean, that's, I, I can't remember if I said it on the program or when we were talking beforehand, but uh, the the dearth of Catholic psychologists out there available for people, and what you're saying is this is the part of the reason, is that there's a screening process that prevents them from going all the way into practice. Yes, I think that's true. I think that's true. I, I saw that in graduate school with other people, not just with me, but other people who... Um, were uh, scolded and um, for their faith. I'm thinking of one evangelical woman in particular that was scolded for her faith. But um, so I moved out and uh, went into private practice, and then I joined a clinic where I work now, which is an ecumenical clinic. Hmm. And uh, at our clinic, um, we're asked every year, I don't know if other clinics do this, but we're asked every year, what kinds of cases do you like to see and what kinds of cases do you not like to see? And there's a whole list. Mm 
and one of them says gay issues, LGBT issues, um, uh, same-sex marriage, and so forth. And by not checking those, you never will have those couples or people referred to you. Um, the re reason why I don't do gay issues is because if I tell them what I'm honestly thinking about the situation and what will actually help them, uh, the vast majority of people with same-sex attraction become angry. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, uh, more recently, they may leave and uh, initiate a lawsuit. So uh, rather than go through that, I just say I won't, I won't see them. Transgender, that's another one mm -hmm. that um, I don't see. It's, uh, it's like the inmates have taken over the asylum. Uh, where if a young person has, uh, a young man feels like he's a woman, that instead of treating his feeling, you treat his body and uh, perform yeah. acts on his body to make him appear like a woman and so forth. So, um, so that's, um, those are some of the things that, um, uh, that I think have uh, where my faith has had an impact on your on that. But when I look at people, you see them on TV and movies. I uh, read about them in the newspaper doing horrendous things, buying in the lifestyles that you know our grandparents would have never even conceived of. Right. You know when when Huxley and Orwell wrote their futuristic novels that they didn't even dream in their visions of a future that'd be anything like the, the changes we've seen, especially in views of sexuality and lifestyle. And you try to understand from a psychological standpoint how people could be thinking that way. Um, was there a hardening of conscience in their lives starting early, you know what I'm saying, that to the point where that that's that inner feeling that this is wrong is just hardened or covered or pushed aside. What do you think? Well, I think that it's um, they're getting it probably from their families and also from the culture that um, they have the idea of absolute freedom, uh, which means I ought to be able to, d to decide whatever I want to decide and to do whatever I want to do. And what makes something right is that I freely chose it. It doesn't matter what it was. Mm -hmm. It's just that I freely chose it. And so parents are starting to raise children uh, to, to feel that way, mm -hmm. to, to feel that if you want something, if you want to do something, then you should simply do it. And if, and if there's a voice within our conscience uh, Pascal's idea that that inner void or that voice or, mm. you know, Augustine talking about that, that heart need, um, that if, if they're inundated with the idea of freedom is really what defines it, then they can quit just telling that voice to shut up or ignore it or that pretty soon it's gone. Yeah. The voice is not a nag. And um, if you ignore it, it speaks softer and softer and softer. And finally, you can't hear it anymore. So... Yeah. Yeah. So in your counseling work, what kind of, what are you encountering today in terms of your, your clientele compared to 30, 40, 50 years ago? Well, one of the type of clientele that I'm seeing is young women. It's very sad. Young women, about 30, unmarried. They have three or four children by two or three different men. They're on welfare. Um, they perhaps have a year of college and then they opted out. And they're depressed. Yeah, I mean. And um, they, they come to see me. And they're maybe presently living with a boyfriend. And so it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, what I tell young women like that is y you are selling yourself short. Uh, you need to be much more demanding than you are hmm. of, of this man. And, um, he, and I tell them they need to stop having sex with him. And they either will s stop coming to see me, 
or they will say, this is more common sense than I've heard in my whole life. You know, it depends against the grace of God. <laughs> it's like, like, you know, I opened the program with Paul meeting Lydia, mm. and it's, you know, here she is, the, 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 the Lord awakened her by grace, and that's what we hope happens to these ladies. Reminds me of Jesus meeting the woman at the well who's had all those husbands, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, trying to put ourselves in the shoes of of women like that, and what would be an answer for them? You know, mm. hopefully that 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 their hearts would be awakened to faith and grace, and they would turn to trust God, and then, but that doesn't answer all their problems, but at yeah. least opens it gets them, them started to a to a solution. Mm -hmm. We have an email. Sam from Orlando writes: Most faithful Catholics would agree that marriage is undergoing a crisis today. What are some of the things that have caused this crisis, and how can we? work to help foster a culture and faith life that promotes authentic Christian ideals for marriage and family life? Well, I think that um, one of the things that has caused a conflict or a crisis in marriage is the acceptance of contraception, yeah. because it separates um, love from children. Mm -hmm. And also the idea of uh, no-fault divorce. I think that's another thing that has um, weakened marriage. Um, and then I think also uh, Hollywood has done a great deal yeah. to weaken marriage. It presents marriage as a, a romantic thing only. Yeah. Um, in many cases, the story ends with the couple getting married, but it doesn't show them going on to have children and to resolve conflicts and so forth. It sells people the idea that marriage is basically a consumption. It's a getting something uh, rather than an investment, uh, that you're giving something. And um, I think those are some of the, um, that I would hit on right away as uh, things that are weakening marriage. I think also the idea uh, that was very common in the 80s and more so now is I, I have a right to be happy. And, um, uh, and I also have a right uh, to make sure that my needs are met. And if your needs interfere with my needs, then I have a duty to myself to make sure that my needs predominate. Mm. And when you enter marriage with that mindset, it isn't going to work. Boy, uh, yeah, I remember back that same time period, 80s, I remember once turning on TV and there was a love boat. Remember the old mm -hmm. love boat? And this episode happened to be a cruise that was full of engaged couples. And then the captain did the mass marriage and they told him to fill in the blank. I, everybody yeah. said their name, take thee, everybody fill in the, to be my lawful wedded spouse for as long as we both shall love. Yeah. I mean, there we go. I mean, yeah. and especially if Hollywood says that that love yeah. is not an act, but it's a feeling. Yeah. And that can be gone in five minutes. Right? I mean, that's... Another thing that I think is, is the, the separation of children from the consideration of marriage, um, mm -hmm. that when couples divorce or deciding whether to divorce or not, they will just consider uh, what's in it for me, uh, what will happen if I stay, what will happen if I leave. They, and they all too frequently don't consider what about the impact on the children. Um, you know, we used to think mm, back in the 80s again that um, couples could divorce if they did it civilly and in a polite way. The children would be upset maybe for a month. Uh, you know, going to a new school, living in a new home, maybe. But they would soon settle down and they would do just fine. Uh, and um, but uh, more evidence has been coming through to us, uh, especially longitudinal studies that have been done on children of divorce. And these studies don't ask the parents how they think the children are doing. They ask the children who are now adults, what was it like? And we're getting a totally different picture. <laughs> Uh, it devastates the children um, very often. They feel like they're just torn up the middle, and it makes them um, cautious about commitment because they say, look at what happened to them. So they're cautious to get into commitment, so you're going to see a lot of cohabiting. Uh, they are uh, very hesitant about having children because they think, I wouldn't want to do to my kids what was done to me. 
and they don't know how to deal with anger because look what they did. And so they tend to sit on their anger because they're afraid if I express my anger to my spouse and tell my spouse how I'm really feeling, he'll leave or she'll leave. So there's that. And then they have an uneasy feeling, and they come to counseling about this very often, of impending doom. It's like, when is the other shoe? I'm happy now, but when is the other shoe going to drop and something awful happen? And that kind of goes back to when they were kids. Everything seemed fine. Well, and then all of a sudden, mommy and daddy called them in and said, we have to talk to you about something. And it wasn't fine. So what you see that all you've described is a lack of those three theological virtues. There's no faith. There's no hope. You just talked about that. And mm -hmm. then there's no love, mm -hmm. understanding that. I mean, the, the three cores yeah. to build a marriage on are all lacking as uh, something to begin that with. We've got, we got another five minutes. Let's take an email. Justin from California. My family is considering becoming Catholic. One roadblock we have come up against, though, is the Catholic teaching on the immortality of art, immorality, excuse okay. me, of artificial birth control. Okay. My wife is afraid that we will become Catholics and have 17 kids. <laughs> we only have two now. How can I reassure her and help her to be more open to life? Well, I would start by saying, going back and discussing with her, what is marriage? And what did we do when we got married? Because marital, your sexual intimacy is an expression of that. And when you got married, you said to one another, all that I am, all that I have, I make a gift to you. And all that you are and all that you have, I receive as your gift to me. Um, so when a couple are engaged in sexual intimacy, they are supposed to, supposed to be saying the same thing. But if you introduce contraception into it, you've got a contrary language that's saying the opposite. If the sexual act is saying this, contraception is saying this. It's saying there's part of you I do not wish to receive. Yeah. Uh, there's something about you that I reject. Or there's something about me I do not wish to give you. Um, part of who we are is fertile. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, that part has to be made available to your, to your spouse. By, by using contraception, you're withdrawing that from, from the gift. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have 17 children because, you know, God has arranged it so that uh, women can only become pregnant a few days out of each month. And nowadays, we can determine what those days are uh, with near perfect precision. So couples then are free to make decisions about when to engage in sexual intimacy and when to abstain from it based on whether they have a good reason to avoid pregnancy or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I, as you're explaining that, I'm just reflecting on the great blessings I've had as a father and a husband. Uh, by the grace of God, he opened my heart to my wife, Marilyn, so that we would be married and that we would be fertile and that we would have three wonderful sons, one's becoming a priest, one's mm. helping run the Coming Home Network, who's given us four okay. grandchildren, to my third son, who's a Knight of Columbus and usher at the church. Yeah. I mean, God, the, the grace and the blessings flow mm. when you're open to life. They flow when that, you're open to true. life. That's the beauty of that. And I think that uh, looking again at contraception, sometimes the very language of it betrays it. I mean, they use words like protection and precautions and barrier and sperm killer. Uh, those aren't words of love and intimacy. Those are all words of it's almost like you're getting suited up for warfare. So that sh that should tell tell him something yeah. too, I think. Yeah, that's that. And it's so he's re basically by n not using contraception, he's respecting his wife, and respecting who she is and her total her totality, including her menstrual cycle. We got one minute to go. I want you to tell the audience about your website, Catholic Psych 
Consul.com. Okay, I um, a lot of Catholics have difficulty getting a local counselor or psychologist uh, to, to go to when they need psychological help, and so I instituted um, a telephone counseling service where people can get on my website and see how to get a hold of me, and um, then we set up an appointment and they call me up and we talk for an hour about whatever they want to talk about, and they get. Uh, advice from a Catholic psychologist. Oh, that's again, that's uh, CatholicPsychConsult.com, right. right? And it's on the on the website. Marsh, thank you very much for sharing your journey with us, and God bless you and your continued work and your family. And well, thank uh, you very much. It's thank a pleasure you so being much here. for your work too. I mean, it, it is. It's hard to find. Uh, places where, where Catholics have been able to put up a shingle to offer their <laughs> services for consulting. So it's good to know also about your service. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Marsh's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.